So basically, this is a project that I've been working on for a while, and um, I'm not an expert on any of these people or any of these philosophies or ideas. I'm just learning about them and just sharing that information. So yeah. Um, so if any of these are particularly close to you, and I say something wrong, or interpreted something wrong, or remembered something wrong, wrote it wrong, feel free to correct me. And yeah, a lot. Some of these people you'll notice I've got like a lot more information. Others I have less because the ones with more information are people I've spent more time reading either their material or just reading about their lives. And I hope to add more to everybody eventually. Um, but I think this is a pretty good starting point for understanding revolutionary radical ideology and philosophy in the last. I think the oldest we got here is Josiah Warren, so 1798, and then we go all the way up to with Mao. 1979. So, last couple hundred years. And when I say radical, I mean like uh, most of these, I mean, I'm not really going to deal with the whole left and right thing, but just radical in general. Those who are opposing statism, capitalism, hierarchy, various forms. There's a lot of different opinions and ideas, but those who are pursuing means outside of the government and some mean, some trying to be revolutionary but to instill a new government uh, themselves as the government. Um, so that, you know, typically is anarchism, socialism, communism, anarcho-communism, all these different connections, uh, and we're going to see the main people who propagated these ideas, who, what their main works were, uh, where they were from, you know, when they were born, um, what their strong ideas are, and some of them, like I said, would be more detailed, like where they went, because what I really enjoy is, like, most of this time period, this is, you know, we got to think about, this is like, Enlightenment period, so people are starting to wake up to like religious indoctrination and starting to question gender roles, and you know women are starting to push for rights more and more. And so there's all this revolutionary mindset is going and, and happening all around the world. So we're looking at France, America, Russia, Germany, Ukraine. I mean, there's a whole list of countries that around this time period are just going through revolutions, and also we get to like World War One, World War Two. So that's like. And then back here, the Civil War, so I mean, there's just turmoil happening constantly. And among that is people like starting to, for the first time to start thinking about being free without the king and you know, not having a government, just these really radical ideas and uh, trying to put them into practice. Some people, uh, like we'll see, actually did put them in practice and experiment with them. Others just stayed in the philosophical stage. Others sort of sold out their own ideas and became the dictators they were trying to fight. Um, so. It's interesting and I find it helpful and valuable as an activist and just, you know, somebody interested in history. And like I was saying earlier, you know, this whole time period though, this is all the shit that they've, this time period, we've learned about this time period in school, but we've never learned about these people and like that, hey, while the you know, American people were supposed to see as like founders and heroes, while all that was going on, there's these other people out there proposing these really radical ideas that go against everything that we're supposed to think is like the right ideas, you know. So this is all around that same time period. And, you know, a lot of them we know as far as like Lenin and Stalin, some, you, you probably know like those main names, but there's other people who are lesser known or just not in the history books, and um, I think some of their ideas are worth keeping. So we'll start with Josiah Warren, who is the first, the first American anarchist. He was born in 1798 and he died in 1874, so this is a little bit after 1776. American Revolution, 30 years after that is when he's born. Um, now, so it's interesting is so he's in America at the turn of the century, then like 10 years later, uh, Proudhon, Pierre Joseph Proudhon in France, he was born in 1809. He's typically seen as the first, Amer uh, first anarchist in words, that he like put it, um, or he called himself an anarchist. But before that, and I didn't put him up here, but there's this English guy, William Godwin, who is actually the first person in the last couple hundred years to be seen as uh, who you know came up with philosophical anarchism and put it into ideas. And then Proudhon actually took it further and they called himself an anarchist. We go back even further and look at Lao Tzu and he's the first person we talk about the state of having no government. And, you know, but as far as modern as William Godwin, philosophical anarchism, <coughs> Josiah Warren was around, was a little bit older than Proudhon, but he never called himself an anarchist. Um, but Proudhon was the first one to call himself an anarchist. Did, so, did Josiah Warren ever say he was against the state? Yeah, I mean his. I'll, I'll we'll get into like what his main teaching was, but he was definitely an a, a, a anti-status. But he was after his main goal was like equity, like trying to make like economic exchanges equitable, like you know where nobody was getting over on the other. 
and he saw the state as inherently, you know, uh, involving that, you know, taking equity out of exchanges and making things um, inequitable and unfair for individuals. So he was, he would be seen as an individualist anarchist. His main, one of his main uh, ideas that he propagated and that still, you know, kind of influenced the rest of uh, the American anarchists was sovereignty of the individual was his main principle. He actually <clears throat> spent time with this uh, Scottish guy, Robert Owen, in 1825. Robert Owen came from Scotland and at this time as well, so you're thinking like the 1800s, 1820s, there's a lot of homesteading going on. This is before the Civil War, but after the American Revolution, there's still a lot of land to go out and to explore, and there's relatively little government as far as, you know, big federal centralized government. So Robert Owen, he had come here, and he started uh, various communities. Josiah Warren stayed in one of those communities, and that was probably a big turning point for him because uh, Robert Owen's communities were more, um, they were more of a communist type of mindset, but in a way that Josiah Warren felt was not beneficial, where so like the people within the town were almost uh, afraid to express themselves as individuals about what they felt was going wrong, and so things never got taken care of. And he just, you know, he, he specific, there's a really good quote from Josiah Warren where he basically says that they went against nature by putting the needs of the, the collective above the individual, and eventually that became the downfall of that community. So he still, you know, had saw value in like the and um, what he considered socialism, and, and uh, but he rejected a form of communism. But he still just he felt that you know the needs of the individual have to be have to be key. So he was seeking to create communities where the individual had you know they took responsibility for their own actions and their needs, uh, they were free to meet their needs, but also as a community. So that, that was a really important um, period in his life. He also, he ran a paper called The Peaceful Revolutionist. I believe it was the first American, like, news, uh, American anarchist newsletter. And another one of his ideas was cost the limit of price. He really believed in the, the labor theory of value, and he believed that everything should, you know, that it should cost what it took to go into it. So he started the Cincinnati Times Store, where everything in the store was priced by the hours that it took to go into it. So, you know, there might be, you know, bag of potatoes or just different things that people from the community would come put there, and they would price them like that. <clears throat> and it was interesting, it was like, so that's one, like, you have the cost, basically. What's it called? Uh, the Cincinnati Times Store. Cincinnati Times Store? Mm -hmm. So basically, whatever you have in there, it's, it's, it's priced at the time that took you to produce it, plus a small percentage to cover the overhead of the store. And then also, it's like, so you come into the store, it's really weird how they describe it. Like, you go into the store, and they had like a clock, but it wasn't really a clock, but the piece, people basically called it like a clock, which is how it got its name, like the Times Store. And so you'd come in there, and you'd look at, you'd look at where the clock was at when you walked in, and you'd go around and do your shopping, and then you'd also have to keep track of like where it was when you left, and that factored into the, the time, the price as well, because his goal was basically just to get people in and out, like, <laughs> like you know, just like to go make, just go in there, like you're penalized your, for staying too long. Shit, make your fucking purchase. So it's like that. That was those That's were the prices. That's a cute thing to do. It's basically a small percentage for like the overhead store, the cost of exactly the time that it took, and then like whatever time you spent in the store. Those were all factored in it. Um, so it became known as the time store. But it was actually really successful, and it lasted several years, and it still exists in some form. I think they kind of turned it into a museum. Um, I really, really have just been greatly inspired by Josiah Warren the past few months that I've been getting more into him. So the community he had with Robert Owen was called New Harmony, Indiana, and he was there in 1825. He left two years, 1827, and that's when he kind of rejected that communism. He tried two communities. One was known as Utopia, and the other one was known as Modern Times. Utopia was in Ohio, and Modern Times was in Long Island, and uh, the town still exists. Modern Times became Brentwood, and there's like a museum to, to him and his communities. And uh, the one book that really is helpful in understanding his work that I've been reading is Men Against the State. They do a great job of like giving a biography of his life and all the paths that he took and how it influenced his work. Because what I really like about him is he was definitely a, uh, a guy who wanted to put the theory into practice, you know, so he started several of these communities, he would go around and give lectures and just talking about like trying to create new communities and they describe it, it's really awesome, they like, you know, every, they describe like how the streets are and then saying like every yard basically had a garden in it and there's the, each, they had a time store, they had a school there. He was also an inventor, he created like his own um, musical notation system. He invented a whole bunch of like typesetting that's still in the Smithsonian today um, and just really, really genius guy. 
And he was all about like skill shares and just trying to, he was against the apprenticeship system and he said that it was a monopoly system for them to hold like knowledge instead of spreading it. So he was all about trying to teach people how to do all those things so they didn't need to go through these apprenticeships and could have the skills themselves. So he really tried to instill those ideas in these various communities. His communities were also associated with like the greater free love movement because since they were all about the individual, they didn't care if you got married, you know, according to the church or you know, the state or whatever. So they allow, and you know, if you're a woman, if you wanted to have, you know, do whatever, like they they allow that in their community. So, and he wasn't, of course, against that. He was all about the power of the individual. But it, it definitely seemed like at times he kind of got upset that or frustrated that their communities were starting to get this notoriety because they were this conservative society who was just like they're wild and crazy, whatever. And he's like, no, you need to look into the theories I'm promoting, and you know, he's just trying to get them to pay attention to that, but. So there's a lot of times where like the, the surrounding communities start like spreading all these rumors and he like sends a letter to one of the local newspapers and has all the community members sign and basically explains like these are the theories we're trying to test, this is what we're really about. <laughs> and then at some point in his life later he's like, I've long like, you know, given up on trying to get editors to listen to like, you know. But he also stressed the importance of communities putting out their own propaganda because he's like, either we speak for ourselves or they're gonna speak for us, you know. So he was really badass and he influenced a lot of these other uh, guys in uh, America. So that's 1798, 1874. The communities were kind of later in his life. And that was really, in America, this unique period of actual experimentation. Like pretty much the rest of the Americans that we're going to talk about are all like philosophical anarchists. You know, they there was no building any more communities. It kind of just, I don't know, if, I think the state maybe just got stronger and it was less of freedom and ability to kind of do that, to try to create these communities within there. And really what was awesome is that the uh, like the time store idea, his it's a form of mutualism and like labor notes. He, you know, they, during the panic of 1827, his communities were not affected like by because they were all still using the labor notes. And so it just shows a lot of these theories in practice and they had great ways to deal with so many different things. To me, that's really like where I'm fascinated is his journals of the time in those communities and what they learned in there. I think there's a lot of value in that. Um, but yeah, so he was really unique as far as trying to actually put that into practice. And then before we go to Proudhon, I want to mention another guy who kind of followed him but was alive around, they were alive around the same time. His name's Stephen Pearl Andrews. This guy was, I, th I think he's equally important. He didn't write as, as much and he's really just kind of, his claim to fame it seems these days is that he was able to put Josiah Warren's word, like work uh, into words better than he was able to. Josiah Warren said that his book Science of Society like captured his ideas better than he ever was able to. Um, Pearl Andrews was 1812 to 1886. He was an individualist influenced by Warren. <clears throat> Together they established Modern Times in 1851 in New York. He believed in something called Pantarchy and I can't remember exactly how he described that but he was I know that he spent most of his life basically he had like a, a year or two period where he was like an individualist anarchist and then he had he went through a lot of changes, basically. He was like a rapid, which is kind Pantarchy, of cool. Is that like the rule of all, or what is that? Well, he was something like that. Like, he was basically, like, science and society, by the end of his life, he was trying to create, like, this theory of everything type of thing. So he, like, said that he pulled from individuals and anarchism. He pulled from, like, all these different things he'd gone through in his life, and by the end, like, had created this theory that he thought. And he called it a universalism, as I think, what, what he found. You can look up. It's really, that goes into some whole other areas that are really interesting. These guys are just amazing because they're constantly thinking up new ideas and projects, and a lot of them. You know, some of them go places, others don't, but they're just really putting out a lot of radical ideas. He advocated labor notes and currency and labor hours. He was the first American to train like Marx. Um, and then, oh, some other stuff I found when I was researching him. He spent some time in Texas. This dude was also an abolitionist, you know, advocating for the abolition of slavery. And so they came into Houston, and he came down to Galveston. And you gotta remember, like, back in the day, Galveston was like pirates and just like crazy, you know, nonsense going up there. And they definitely didn't want anybody telling them they couldn't have slaves. So he went down there and he was speaking and I found this old newsletter, like really old, and it's like copied online, where it described basically him being, him going and speaking in Houston and then going to Galveston and then like, he was scheduled to give a talk before he could even get there. These guys, these armed men just come like, get, tell him like, you're getting the fuck out of town and like, take him to this ferry all the way out. And then he describes like being, you know, driven out by these racists and telling him like, don't come back again. And, <laughs> and he describes like coming into the prairies of Houston and like being chased out by a crowd and stuff. Wow. And it's just crazy to think, you know, that that's kind of where, that was going on around here. Um, but yeah, so he, he put Josiah Warren's uh, words really well and took the ideas and kind of elaborated on them. Um, Science of Society is probably a good place to start to look into him. 
Now is um, up here back to France, Proudhon. He is, you know, typically seen as the first anarchist. He was born in 1809. He died in 1865, so right around the American Revol uh, Civil War. And he is sort of seen as one of the first propagators of the ideas of mutualism, of a mutualist economy. He was a capitalist. He believed in, you know, he's often He's, he's often quoted as saying property as theft, but he also said property is freedom, and like, you know, so it's like, it's just interesting because you can take a lot of his works and kind of, That's sometimes funny. they'll not necessarily contradict each other, but there's more to, than just those catchphrases, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, also a lot of these people, as radical as some of them were, they're also, some of them were like anti-Semitic or like still had sexist views, and you know, so they're not all necessarily perfect on a lot of areas, you know, they had some radical ideas, but then still kind of held back in other areas. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't learn from the ideas. So what I like about him is that his, his, his concepts on property were a little bit more in-depth than some people try to promote them as. He did believe in personal property, and as far as, uh, you know, land, he talked about possession or use or occupation, you know, instead of actual ownership of land, but being in possession of it. Um, and that gets into some other, you know, other questions about how that type of system would work. You so know, how is that like squatters' rights? You know, it could be seen like that. You know, it, and to me, it gets into questions of how do you, if if we were in a society where there was no such thing as ownership of property, but we had this concept of possession, like if it's, if it's in use or occupying, then it's you know technically yours. But what if you want to go on vacation? You know, how long? Do you, are you allowed to go before somebody can come and say, okay, well, now you've been gone more than seven days, this is now my property, you know, if, since there's no ownership, you know, so it's it's just interesting to start trying to understand those concepts of how we would, how, because I don't necessarily think that ownership and private property is always going to be the answer, and I think there are some... Um, that kind of reminds me of uh, the, with uh, Rousseau's origins on inequality, where he's talking about the noble savage, mm -hmm. just kind of occupying a space of land, Briefly, and then someone may chase him off. He's like, "Okay, well, I'll just go to this piece of land and use this." You know, so it's kind of like non-violent. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not, not exactly sure how we can solve the property question. You know, but that's. I think that's probably one of his biggest contributions. And now we're going to kind of get into Marx. Is that basically they were not the first people, but a lot their ideas and I guess the way they were able to put them in and promote them were helped get that question out there and start questioning. You know, what is property itself, and what you know. The concept of, uh, of private property, and we're going to see with Marx questioning the means of production. So this, just as far as what was going on this in France. Crazy. Okay, so Proudhon um, argues with Rousseau. The only difference between mm -hmm. them and Rousseau is the um, is their idea of a contract, I guess. Social contract. Oh yeah, that's yeah. very. Uh, that's what else is awesome. Anarchist. <laughs> All these guys like just being alive at the same time. Yeah. These great minds. Like a lot. Of, we're going to get it as we go further when they start meeting and then debating and like a lot of splits that's what's just crazy is that these people were debating each other they had the same i think they had the same arguments they just had they had different solutions hmm. so when Proudhon was alive we had the french revolution the first one this was before he was alive but this is uh you know these things were still being felt the revolution of 1789 and it was basically a tumultuous 10-year period there then he's born towards the end of his life we have the french revolution of 1848 and then, this is important as well, really important, the Paris Commune from March 18th to May 28th, 1871. So that's only two months long. Basically a <laughs> radical socialist government in that period. And I remember how I was saying earlier, it was just constant revolution basically taking, around, taking place around the world at the time. And the, the Paris Commune, like basically that was after he died, but they were really influenced by a lot of his ideas and, and Marx and others. And Marx was influenced by Proudhon as well. They, they, Debated plenty of times, but so Karl Marx was born in 1818, died in 1883, so he's a little bit younger than Proudhon. Uh, of course, he's uh, he wrote the Communist Manifesto. He talked about the division of labor, uh, the means of production. His analysis of society is really based on the means of production and who's in control of that. Talked about class struggle. His he's known for historical materialism, which is basically that looking at who owns the means of production. And he promoted the dictatorship of the proletariat, this idea that, you know, the workers could seize the means of production and become a temporary dictatorship, and eventually, you know, we'd get to full-on communism where there would be uh, freedom. He, uh, he did advocate, you know, the use of force and, and these goals. He believed that, uh, you know, capitalism would lead to socialism, which would lead to, to communism. Um, and, yeah, I mean, there's... 
He was wrong. Just right. study him. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot. He, whether or not we agree with his uh, analysis, it's influenced so much of everything oh, yeah. in our world now because people do agree with it. And he was influenced largely by Hegel. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Hegel. I mean, the, a lot of these people were influenced by Hegel in different ways. Mm -hmm. Like we're gonna get to Stirner and others. So Karl Marx, he's over here in Germany spreading these ideas. Proudhon in France and Josiah Warren in America. And again, he's more focused on the individualist. He's looking a lot at the property question and advocating mutualism, definitely anti-capitalist. And I think that they would make, that even the Americans could be centered, could be considered anti-capitalist, even if maybe by a different definition, even if they weren't really analyzing it by the means of production. But what they advocate, what they consider to be this private class of people seizing control and like you know, he was saying, they they create inequities through the state, you know, and by powering with the state. So they had. You know, they, they definitely had some common ground. Okay, so Marx, and who else? Okay, so just a little bit after, 10 years after Josiah Warren's born, and around the same time that Proudhon's born, a year later, uh, Lysander Spooner was born in America, and he's a really, really important, important guy. He's an individualist, American anarchist, he was also an abolitionist, and a very, very talented and educated lawyer, and not talented in the sense that he succeeded in their system, but that he definitely understood the law, um, and probably that's why he didn't continue to be a lawyer after that. Um, 1808? 1808 to 1887. I think that he's an early agorist and like an early practitioner of creating, um, creating entrepreneurship out to compete with the government, because in 1844 he founded the American Mail Letter Company, which directly was trying to compete with the U.S. Postal Service. And, of, of course, eventually they made him shut, they forced him to shut down. What was cool was that even in the short period that he was able to do business, because he was just like, we can do better, let's, you know, let's create something else. And um, because of that competition, he forced the government to, they created a three-cent stamp to try to, because they were trying to be competitive like <laughs> what he was doing. So he did actually kind of spur them to some action, but ultimately, of course, they shut him down. And even at that point, 1844, they had the control already. Like, so they were already against people trying to compete and do their own services. Um, he was a natural law advocate, which, you know, basically he believed that, you know, rights were, come from natural law or, you know, some derivative up there, um, which is uh, really influential for everybody, like Benjamin Tucker and pretty much the other American anarchists. His ideas, Spooner's ideas on natural law influenced them, and then as we, we're going to get further on, we'll see that there's a controversy once people start questioning the the interpretation of rights as being natural law or interpreting from interpreting it from that way, uh, but for the most part, that's where the Americans seem to like kind of draw their conception of rights. Um, these are people that are just writing. Yeah, like Spooner was. These were all like he wrote a bunch of awesome books. Like, but he was actually like I said, he created the American Mail Letter Company. So I feel like he was more, and he was trying to fi file like cases against the government through his law okay. knowledge. And what's crazy is in 2008, I actually think 2008 and then maybe once or twice since then, his work, this the book, Con The uh, Unconstitutionality of Slavery, was cited in two different Supreme Court decisions. Oh, wow. So he does have like respect in that world, even though like, and he was, like, or back then he was just seen as like crazy abolitionist. And, but he was also a big advocate of jury nullification because that's, um, you know, which is why there's sort of this idea of bringing it back. Because he was advocating it as, and talking about how in the North people were doing that to free slaves and basically saying like, you know, we don't, no, this person isn't owned and like nullifying things that way. He was also anti-intellectual property, which was kind of cool for being so far back then. A lot of people are anti-intellectual property these days because of the internet and it makes more sense now. But he was like, even back then was really against it. Um, so we yeah, have the unconstitutionality of slavery. That's a good work. He has a series of pamphlets, the No Treason series, uh, probably the most famous which, of which is uh, the Constitution of No Authority, which is really awesome. He basically just totally undermines the Constitution itself. And he has another one called Vices Are Not Crimes, which is what it sounds like. Um, so yeah, he that's Lysander Spooner, really, really also influential. So there's, you know, he was alive during the time period of Josiah Warren, but it seems like from what I've been reading, that they didn't really have a whole lot of interaction. Like they definitely were aware. Of, these guys were definitely aware of Warren's work, but it seems like he was spending his time just building these communities, um, you know, and really just spent most of his life doing that. Like he, I don't think there was probably he had a wife, but really I don't know, dude. They, I don't know how they had any kids because it seemed like he was super busy, just like inventing shit all the time and just like writing and Josiah Warren. Josiah Warren, yeah. So he had one wife. He had a wife. 
<laughs> one? Yeah, he wasn't into the free lust. I'm just wondering. I mean, well, because he was open to it, I was wondering. Yeah, but it was just like it Do seemed like he probably was. Little, it he was probably more it? conservative. It seemed like in some ways because he was frustrated <laughs> with them, but he ultimately, of course, went with the sovereignty of the individual. So he's like, you know, they have the, the freedom to do that. You know, but like that's not, you know, my thing. So after Spooner, let me see if there's anybody kind of jumping in our timeline here yet. Oh, wait, 18. Yeah, let's go over here first. Okay, so we've laid out a couple of the Americans, France, Marx. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting is where these ideas kind of, of anarchism, communism start to intersect and go in different directions. Uh, Mikhail Bakunin, he's a very important Russian anarchist. He was born in 1814. So he's four years older than Marx, five years younger than Prudhomme, um, and about 15 years younger than... Warren. So they're all around the same time period. So he was an advocate of uh, collectivist anarchism. He's kind of seen as the father of that. Um, he considered himself to be a social anarchist. He spent some time uh, briefly using the military, and that seems to have influenced his thinking. Um, in 1840, he began traveling. He went from Germany and then France. He was really becoming like a student of philosophy, and that's why he left the military. He was more interested in just studying philosophy. In 1842, he met Marx and Proudhon, so the three of them all connected. This is where, you know, the first anarchist, Communist Manifesto, they intersect with this guy, and, you know, he kind of creates his own whole web of people. Really powerful meeting, uh, I would imagine. Um, so the three of them meet and start having, you know, discussions, and there seemed to be a mutual respect, but definitely there was also, there would be conflicts uh, down the line because uh, Marx thought that Bakunin was an agent of some sort. So in 1848, the German Revolution, this is, basically if you look up revolutions of 1848, there's like 15 different countries where revolutions just happen like all around the time period. He went to, the uh, Bakunin went to the German Revolution, he also went to the Czech Revolution, and at that time he wrote something called Appeal to the Slav, and he was really just going around, I guess, getting involved in these revolutions and studying them and trying to preach his message and um, just develop strategy and help them. In 1849, he was arrested and imprisoned for 13 months for his role uh, in the uprising in Dresden. So that's 1849. That's just going around him speaking and traveling around talking about his ideas of anarchism. He gets arrested and he's locked up for two years. And in May, 18, May 1851, he's handed over to Russian authorities where he spends another three years in a dungeon at St. Peter Paul Castle. And then four more years in another castle in Schlisselberg and he lost all his teeth to scurvy because he was really <laughs> sick and they weren't treating him very well.